everybody. Uh, it's me, Alice Gratruin. Uh, I'm the director for Advanced Lung and Heart Disease at HRN. HRN is a facility that does cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation, both physical as well as uh, virtual means. means, meaning that we use telehealth or like telemedicine where we see the patient, patient sees us. That's what I mean by virtual. Anyways, uh, today's topics, uh, we're looking at the weather a little bit more closer because the weather has been a little bit crazy throughout the United States and of course other parts of the world too. Um, first off, tree pollen begins to release in February. Okay, in many areas of the United States, spring allergies begin in February, February and last until the early summer. Tree pollination begins earliest in the year, followed by grass pollination later in the spring and summer and ragweed in late summer. In February, trees can cause your allergies to flare up and at, this, uh, at the, around this time of year, depending on where you live. We can see tree pollen as early as February, even in the Northeast, um, and that was in reference to Margie Slankard, uh, uh, Dr. Margie Slankard, uh, an associated attendant physician and director of allergy clinic in, at New York, Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. That's a lot to say there. <laughs> in the United States, trees that commonly cause allergies include um, elm, hickory, olive, pecan, sycamore, and walnut, as well as uh, catalpa. Catalpa. If I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. Um, anyways, um, so climate changes and allergy seasons are coming up, right? So uh, let's look at bronchitis a little more closer. Okay, so first off, let me give you the definition as stated through uh, American chest physicians as well as the American Association of Respiratory Care and what they define bronchitis. So in bronchitis, I'll, I'll give the definition off of this book as well as give a layman's term uh, for a better explanation just, just in case the medical lingo is a little bit too much. Good morning, everybody, good morning. Uh, I found out exactly type I got. It's central tubular emphysema. Gotcha, Rex. No worries. Okay, so bronchitis. The definition of uh, bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchial mucosa that can be acute or chronic. Chronic bronchitis is classified as COPD. Definition for chronic bronchitis includes cough with mucus production most days for three months or longer for two consecutive uh, years. Now, the uh, ideology behind it is hereditary factors, acute bronchitis associated with viral or bacterial infections or inhalation of, chemical, uh, of chemicals, pollutants, or air, air, irritants. Uh, chronic bronchitis associated with long-term exposure to inhaled smoke and other pollutants, occupational exposures to chemicals, chronic asthma, and uh, frequent pulmonary infections. Uh, greatly increase the airway resistance with air trapping. So any type of disease with air trapping is COPD. So if there's any, any disease that causes air trapping like later to of asthma. So what are our five types of COPDs? Does anybody remember those five types? You have cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. Now it's not the beginning starting of asthma it's the later descent where it's unmanaged and turns to an obstruction. Okay, so let's look at the obstruction really quick on the board. So let's say this is my alveoli, or what I would call the alveolar sac. Okay, so I have my alveolar sac right now. Right, and then I have, what is this called? An airway, what type of airway? Bronchioles. Okay, so we're looking at bronchitis. Okay, so that's where the airways are inflamed. So this is, I'm lining up inflamed airways. So when air comes in through here, it's gonna go through all this inflammation and when it does that it causes wheezing where I would sound like a mu musical instrument in a sense so how do we fix this problem usually it's medications um, 
so let's, let's say, for instance, my doctor gave me albuterol. So I would take an albuterol treatment to alleviate the symptoms of this. But um, let me bring up something that happened uh, the other day is I had a person that took their inhaler, okay? They brought their inhaler, but when they actuated it, they did it completely wrong. So meaning when they actuated to get the medication into them, they got it, it was completely wrong. Uh, the other medications that I looked at that this person had were dry powder inhalers, which are great if you can qualify for them. Okay, not all medications everybody's going to qualify for, meaning that I'm not talking about insurance or things like that. I'm talking about you yourself, your qualification for your, uh, you know. So, so let's say you have a patient that is on Advair, okay? And the patient that's on Advair, Advair is a very good drug to use, a very good corticosteroid. So uh, let's say I, I took Advair, but if I didn't inhale deep enough, if I didn't inhale too fast, it has to be at a certain speed and depth it might not make it all the way deep inside to reach this area here, okay? So meaning, so this, remember, what, how many of these do we have? You got about like 300 million of them in your lungs, okay? So you have a lot of them. But if you're having all these wheezing complications because of bronchitis, it can be acute bronchitis or chronic bronchitis, but chronic bronchitis is a you know, it's a chronic situation where you're producing a lot of um, uh, pus-filled sputum. I know it doesn't sound great, but it's, it's, that's what it is. Um, so you produce sputum, you're very productive, meaning you cough a lot. And when you cough, you bring out a lot of things, right? You bring out a lot of congestion. So when the person was on, uh, on Advair, I asked this person to, this patient, to use your Advair uh, and just pretend I already actuated it, I triggered it. And all you have to do is just breathe in through it. The person did this, grabbed the Advair, and they took a deep breath in. They blew into it. And, of course, I was flabbergasted. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking my medication. I says, no, you're not. You're supposed to bring in the medication into your lungs. You're breathing out. He says, oh, I thought that's how I was supposed to use it. Well, of course, in that case, that person doesn't qualify for it because the person has been breathing out. Uh, instead of inhaling the medication, they've been blowing it where all the medication comes out through the atmosphere and doesn't come into the body at, at all. So I also asked this person with their um, health care provider that was with them, a health aide, and I said, so the person's on albuterol, your patient's on albuterol, um, that's fine, right? But show me how it's used. And that's why I asked the patient, health care provider's right there. And the health care provider is supposed to help this patient, okay? So this uh, was a nurse, all right? So I asked the patient, not the health care provider, I asked the health care provider to be with me when I'm oh, for this demonstration. And the, uh, the patient picked up the meter dose inhaler, albuterol, okay, the rescue inhaler, and did this. They did about, uh, he did about, um, probably about four actuations. So he did one, two, three, four, and inhaled. Okay, but did it completely wrong. If you take your, if you take an actuator and you shake it up and you breathe in like this, let's say I'm, I, this is me actuating it, I inhale like this, you did it wrong. It never actually went in you at all. Like maybe a smidge, but it didn't go down deep enough. Okay, when you breathe in fast, when you breathe in uh, medication quickly, it's just going to hit the back of your throat. It's not going to go down deep. If you have a, if somebody, if that sounds like you, I would recommend a spacer. Just something as simple as a spacer, and I can go over how a spacer is used. But you would use a spacer in line with the meter dose inhaler. Uh, but Remember, to qualify for a meter dose inhaler, you have to be able to hold your breath for 10 seconds. You have to be able to breathe in deep enough to get the medication into your lungs. Okay? So this person still had bronchitis, uh, chronic bronchitis, of course, um, but the, this symptom was not alleviated, meaning the person was still wheezing after their 
meter dose inhaler because it never reached deep enough to affect this area. Okay, so in that case, we would go with what, everybody? Nebulizers. Okay, you will go with a nebulizer, get the volumes up, back up with, by strengthening on, uh, the respiratory muscles, strengthen those up so, you can, so that person can inhale deeper to get the me medication deep enough to meet proper deposition. Okay, so this person was, uh, that had you know, bronchitis, or chronic bronchitis, had a lot of sputum, uh, but the medication he was using was not the correct one. The albuterol was correct, but the meter dose inhaler, the delivery system, was not correct. Like if I brought up a nebulizer vial, okay, nebulizer versus a meter dose inhaler. Nebulizer, meter dose inhaler. Which one is the rescue inhaler? If you thought it was this, you are not correct. Now, technically, this is a rescue inhaler, but just as much as this is. If this is albuterol in there and this is albuterol, they still work the same exact way. Okay? Meter dose inhalers people like because it only takes a couple seconds to do it. Nebulizers take 10 minutes on average, you know. But if they're both albuterol, then they're both rescue inhalers. Don't look at them in any other, in any other way. If anybody told you anything different, tell them to get the money back to the school they went to because that's, that's, that's not correct. So these are both rescue inhalers. I would recommend this one with a nebulizer with somebody who has low lung volumes and that breathes very shallow, if that sounds like you and you're on a meter dose inhaler, you might want to talk to me, okay? So, and I don't make things up. These are based off of facts. So if some other person told you something different, all I would have to do is just tell you where to find the references. And you would go to the, let's say, the American Association of Respiratory Care.org and you'll go on there and just type in meter dose inhaler, how to use. Or just put in like on search engine, how to use a meter dose inhaler. Okay, but looking at the qualifications. To, to take that medication, you have to be able to hold your breath for 10 seconds. Okay, not 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Okay, uh, so when somebody actuates it, you know, they actuate as they're breathing in. So how it usually works is as I'm breathing in, I actuate as I'm bringing in a quarter of the volume in to my lungs, meaning volume I'm talking about breathing, okay? So volume is how much air is coming into my lungs, all right? So if I breathe in shallow and I can only breathe in at 500 milliliters or 750 milliliters, well, that's good enough for a small animal to take a medication and for a meter dose inhaler to be good for that. But how this works is that, let's say I have my medication and I'm using my arms, my, my hand to show you I'm breathing in. So this is me breathing in, exhaling, just as demonstration. So I have my actuator. I'm not gonna actuate it first. I'm gonna start to breathe in. This is how I take a meter dose inhaler. This is how I would instruct a patient to take a meter dose inhaler the right way. So as the person's breathing in, they're not gonna hold their breath yet. They're not gonna do anything besides start to inhale. As soon as they start to inhale and they fill up their lungs at least a quarter of air, okay? So they're breathing in a quarter of air actuated at that time. Keep inhaling, keep inhaling, keep inhaling. Then you hold your breath for 10 seconds, then exhale. And if you have to take the next uh, actuator puff, you know, because usually it's two puffs. If you take another one, you, do, you repeat the same process all over again. So I have my actuator, I shake it up first. Okay, I double check to make sure I have medication in there by looking at the meter in, on there. It should be like 200, it could be, uh, maybe there's 200 actuations or whatever. But if you see it's down to zero, then you might wanna replace that canister. Anyways, so as I'm breathing in, let me write it up here. So let's say this chamber here represents 
my total lung volume, okay? Currently on my incentive spirometer, my full breath is at 4,000. That's what I'm currently able to do on my incentive spirometer, okay? So on this incentive spirometer, goes up to 4,000, I can hit 4,000. So let me show you. So I'm gonna double check this by exhaling all the air out of my lungs because I wanna see how much air can come into it. So if there's any air in my lungs currently, I gotta evacuate that, I gotta get rid of that, I have to exhale that, right? So I exhale first. And it's probably higher than 4,000, but the meter only, this, this, this incentive spirometer only goes up to 4,000. But anyway, 4,000 milliliters is the deepest breath I can take. This down here is zero. Okay? So let's divide this. This is half. This is a quarter. Three quarters. So quarter, 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 quarter equals whole of 4,000, right? So. I'm not going to actuate. Actuations would start a quarter of the breath in, okay? A quarter of the breath in. So let's say this. I have my, let's pretend this is an actuator, a uh, meter dose inhaler, albuterol, okay? All right. So I shake it up. Now I pl put it in my mouth, okay? I start to breathe in. As soon as I get, fill up my lungs at least a quarter of my breath, meaning a f not a full breath, a quarter of it. So you breathe in a quarter of the air. As soon as it reaches a quarter, actuate it and don't stop. Meaning once you reach a quarter, d don't stop your breath, actuate and then continue breathing. Make sure there's no, no disruptions in flow. So there's no interruptions in flow. So you're breathing in, you're still breathing in, you're still breathing in, you're still breathing in you're still breathing in, right? There's no, but as soon as I start to breathe in, I have the actuator in my mouth, right? It's shooken up, it's all ready to go. As soon as I reach a quarter, I actuate it, then keep breathing in, keep inhaling, keep inhaling until I fill up my lungs all the way, and then hold your breath at your deepest for 10, 10 seconds, okay? So as you fill up your lungs, you're not disrupting flow. Remember, you're not inhaling to a quarter, stop, actuate, then continue breathing. You don't ever do that. You breathe in. As soon as you fill up some air in your lungs, a quarter of the volume is necessary. So as you fill your lungs up, a quarter of the air, like quarter of the volume in your lungs, actuate at that point. Keep continuing to breathe in slowly. The time to breathe in, the di like the timing is always very important too. Usually that's why we'd use a spacer. So if you ever used a spacer and you put a meter dose inhaler into it and you breathe in really quick, it whistles. That means we shouldn't be breathing in that fast. Does that also mean if I have to breathe that slow without using a spacer and I, don't, I just have on my, on my meter dose inhaler, I don't have a spacer, does that mean I have to breathe that slow when I take that medication? So if with a spacer to prevent that whistling, because that's telling you you're breathing in too fast. The, the speed of how fast I breathe in through a spacer is about this slow. So breathing, so I'll, you know, I, I breathe in. It's slow. That means without a spacer, I should be breathing in that same speed. Let, let me let me show you. Let, let me grab let me grab one really quick here. Well, you guys can still hear me. Hold on, hold on. I'm just gonna grab a spacer really quick and show you what I'm talking about because seeing it versus just explaining it is, is I feel like two different stories. Let me grab this. I just I'd rather show you. Okay. All right. I apologize. I'm just running. Hold on a sec. Okay. Can we get close up on this? 
So this is a spacer, okay? I would put a meter dose inhaler in the back end of the spacer, okay? So the other devices like this or uh, rest mat, even though rest mat would fit in, you don't ever use a, uh, a spacer with a rest mat. Even if your pharmacist says, yeah, do it, don't. Anyways, as soon as I put a meter dose inhaler into there and I breathe in, it whistles. Sounds like a harmonica. That means I'm breathing too fast. So how fast I breathe in counts. So if I breathe in this slow to prevent the whistle, so remember, I have my, pretend I have my medication in there. Okay, just pretend this is a meter dose inhaler. I know it's a respa mat, but just pretend it's a meter dose inhaler. Okay, so I put one puff in here. Okay, as I breathe in, I want to prevent that sound. So I have to breathe in slower. That's how slow I'm supposed to breathe in with, through a spacer. That means without a spacer, I also, and just pretend this is a meter dose inhaler, not a Respimat, even though this is a Respimat version, meaning Respimat, you twist them, you press, it creates mist and it comes out. Okay, but just pretend this is a meter dose inhaler and not a Respimat that, that this is. Okay, so if I'm inhaling this medication, and according to the, uh, to the spacer, I have to breathe slow if I had a spacer, right? Does that mean if I didn't have a spacer and I actuate this, I breathe in a quarter, actuate, I still have to breathe slow? Yes, not fast. Because if you breathe in too fast, the reason why the spacer won't allow you to do that or it doesn't want you to do that because it, it, it alarms, right? It makes that sound if you breathe in too fast is because you're not supposed to be inhaling that quickly. Because if you inhale that quickly, just simple physics, okay, simple physics. If you breathe in fast, the particles in the air that you're breathing in when you actuate hits the back of the throat. So the medication is going to the back of the throat, not going all the way deep into the lungs. So when you breathe in, you breathe in slow to bring in that medication. Well, that patient couldn't do that. So, bronchitis. Now, acute bronchitis is an acute form, meaning that it's a very short period of time. If you feel that your bronchitis or your wheezing is feeling like it's unmanaged, it might be a medication problem. You might have the right medications, but the delivery system might not be correct. How it's being brought into your body, how it's being brought into your lungs might not be correct. You want to try to get that medication to go that deep to affect this area. Your lungs, so I drew up a lung here, okay. Air has to go in here, okay. Go deep into both sides of the lungs, really deep. But this right here is just is like a small piece. That's what this represents. This represents that small piece in the lung. It's just mi mi uh, microscopic. It's very small. And I'm just making it into a macroscopic view, okay, meaning larger, so you can see it, okay, because those alveoli are very, very, very small. Anyways, the bronchioles that lead to the alveoli, okay, if they're very well inflamed, then you might want to talk to your doctor if your medication does, is not alleviate, it's not alleviating you from your symptoms. And your current symptoms, you're wheezing, you're winded, all those problems. You're congested, all those problems, right? So if you have those types of problems, but, you real, but when you take your medication, you don't feel like it gives you much benefit at all, might want to talk to your doctor, or at least talk to somebody like me that specializes specifically for this, lung disease lung and heart disease actually okay so bronchitis because of allergy symptoms we want to make sure that our filters and our homes are changed if you're using an oxygen concentrator to bring in oxygen into your body more supplemental oxygen into your body you want to make sure also the filters on that concentrator is clean 
okay? There are external filters where they're put on the very, uh, the very edge or the back of the um, concentrator. You just have to pull that out, wash it with warm soapy water, let it air dry, make sure it's completely dry before you put it back to all the electronical parts. And then you just put that filter back on after it's dried. <coughs> Excuse me, I talk too much. <laughs> so uh, you would put the filter on the back of your uh, concentrator. Now for your nebulizer, let's say if you have a nebulizer, that also has a filter. Check the manufacturer's instructions on where to find that filter. If that filter is clogged up, then you want to change it out with another one, another filter. There's small little pellet looking filters. They look like the size, maybe, maybe a little bit larger than Altos, like the mint. You know, they're very small. It's like a little bigger than M&M, &M. um, just a little bit bigger than M&M. &M. But uh, yeah, you would put that in there. I think it's about 15, uh, 15 millimeters, about 15. They're not very large. But anyways, it's a filter that you, you put it into your uh, uh, nebulizer. It should already have one in there. Uh, every medical device that you have to inhale through, like a nebulizer or a concentrator, should have their own filter. Okay. Now, your home filter, meaning your heater and your air conditioner, that filter, check the manufacturer's instructions on the filter itself and see how often it should be changed. If you have a filter that you can easily see through, it might only pick up large particles and not small particles like pollen, dust, other expo like other environmental complications that could cause some complications for you and your lungs um, and, of course, your health. So check those filters. A lot of times those filters are three-month filters. Sometimes they're one-month filters, but just double-check those filters. Um, if you find that your filter is blocked up, okay? You want to have a air conditioning person to come out to check your duct work to make sure there's no mold being, being built in your duct work. See, your house can be spotless, but as soon as you turn on a, a heater or air conditioner, and if you have mold build up in your duct work, you're just circulating that mold and you're breathing that in. We found patients like that all the time in here. So it's about 60% of the cases that they're just, everyone's just that has that problem, they're just allergic, feel like they're allergic to everything, you know? But it's actually just the mold heightening up all the other sensitivity, uh, uh, all those other stuff. Um, anyways, anyways. Uh, Facebook user, I have COPD and I, the morning when I get up, I do a nebulized treatment, then do my Spiriva, then do my Advair. Is this the correct order to take them? Yes, it is the correct order as long as your volume is good. So if you can inhale, uh, depending on how tall you are, of course, so if, let's say you're five foot five, if you can inhale at least 1,500 milliliters on your incentive, then you should be able to take the Spiriva and Advair just fine, okay? Um, but yes, that is the correct order. Albuterol is always first to dilate anything, because you want to try to get that medication, that the corticosteroids and the, and the titropium bromide, the Spiriva, that titropium. You want to get that 50 micrograms of titropium into the lungs. How can it go in if it's inflamed? So first medication you always take is the albuterol first. Wait five minutes for your airways to dilate. Then take the controller, which is the Spiriva. The last one you take is the corticosteroid. So it's albuterol. It's A, B, and C. A, albuterol. B, backdoor inhaler. C, corticosteroid. Okay, albuterol, backdoor inhalers, corticosteroid. Always in that order. Always in that order. But yes, very good. Uh, I am almost, I'm almost 62 and was diagnosed with COPD in 2006. I was extremely short of breath and constantly tired due to my COPD. I, you're very welcome. Um, let's see, I was extremely short of breath and constantly tired due to my COPD. I was uh, introduced to health herb clinics and their COPD herbal protocol. I started on the COPD treatment last year. My symptoms gradually diminished, including my shortness of breath, wheezing fatigue, reached them at, who is that, Connie? Connie, we don't, unless there's peer review, do, guys, do not listen to that, to that comment on there. Um, Connie, you, you 
all medications are derived from something natural, okay? When you're trying to give, um, well, if you're trying to give herbal remedies and things like that, some people are allergic to different things. Some things work differently from other people. Um, you know, we go to school as, as doctors and clinicians for years and years and years. It's not to be replaced with Wikipedia or some, you know, health herb clinic. There is nothing there. There's no medication, Connie, in existence to fix these people. There is nothing that fixes stiff lungs. So what you're saying can't be true at all. You may feel that way, but it's not true because by simple physics, you have a stiff muscle. Let's say you have stiff lungs. Which medications alleviate the stiffness? What? How can it do that? It can't do that. Like you, you have somebody in a gurney, in a coma, and I've seen this in a hospital setting where a doctor made a mistake and gave a 5-carbon sugar, which is a, uh, a steroid, not a corticosteroid, a muscle st uh, steroid, to increase muscle mass. Because the person can't move, can't, the muscles can't get stimulated, the medication that the doctor gave, gave to that coma patient was not correct because there was not, there, that patient could not move. You take a steroid and you don't work out, the medication goes to waste. You have to move. The lungs, lungs are stiff. You can't alleviate stiffness from just breathing something in. That's, that's ridiculous to think that. You know, you, you, you can't, so if I have a stiff muscle, I don't take a medication to alleviate the stiffness, I stretch it. You know, there is no medication in existence that can fix stiff lungs. You have to do the right thing. You can't just be giving, I'm almost 62, and you think that's going to be solved. That's the cure. There is no peer review. Look, as a, as a, cl as a clinician, a very well-respected clinician, I am a very well-respected clinician, a very good one, too. If that was the case, I would be giving that information to everybody. But I don't. Why? Because you think I'm trying to make a buck or something? I'm, a cl I'm, a cl I'm on the Maryland Board of Physicians. I'm paying through insurance. I don't make extra, there's not, it, it makes no sense. So Connie, so, uh, please keep that information to yourself because you're going to hurt those people thinking that, oh, I don't have to take this. Let me take this instead. This is my fix. Like there was a whole thing with NAC pills. You have all these doctors saying, oh yeah, take the NACs. Yes, yes. Yes, and then you have these people. They found out it was actually more off the chicken fiber that caused the catalyst to make it happen. They, everyone's saying, oh, let me take one pill. Everyone's looking for that quick, short, and easy, fast solution. In medicine, there is nothing like that. It's not one pill that fixes everybody. You don't take an AC to solve and cure COPD. There is no cure. There is no cure. Work of breathing isn't caused by, by oxygen. It's caused by CO2. You fix the person that can't breathe out as much, and you fix that problem. Come on. Please don't ever listen to information like that. Consult with your doctor before. If you want to decide someone, that's fine. But talk to your doctor first. Please talk to your doctor first. Don't all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to go to this. I'm not trying to be rude and mean. I understand I can be a little sarcastic, but I'm not trying to be mean or, or rude in any way. But you have people that are dying, that don't need to die, that they can live if they do something about it. They can live longer. They can have a better life if they actually go in and actually do the therapy. It has worked. It's been working since we started. If, it, if, the, if the solution was, oh, let's just give a respiratory medication to fix everybody, we would have been doing that. We would have been doing that. Come on. Please, everybody, don't listen to that information. Please. Oh, my goodness. Don't, go, don't think there's a special medication. And you know, technically, there is a special medication, but it's not what you think it is. A medication, imagine. There's a medication that can solve all your problems, okay? 
solve your depression, okay, fix that, fix your heart, fix your lungs, okay. You know what the medication's called? Exercise. It's called begoyam. Get off your butt and move. Literally. That's written by uh, uh, Barry Franklin from uh, Harvard Medical School. Yeah, I went to his lectures, okay. Yeah, yeah, you've got to move. You want to get better, you move. You can't move very well because you can't breathe and fix the breathing first before you move. It's, it's not rocket science, but uh, there is no, that's, that's spam and that person should not be on here, by the way, John, okay? You don't give that type of information that could hurt other people. It's, it's the worst information you could ever give to anybody because this happens a lot where you have somebody that says, oh, there's a new type of medication. No, there isn't. Because if there was, I would have known about it. Dr. Shaw would have known about it. All the other doctors would have known about it and let me know if I didn't know already. There is nothing like that. Okay, and the gummies, the shark tank, the can cure CPD, no way possible. No, gummies? There's a special gummy from Shark Tank. Guys, <laughs> come on. Exactly. I, I know that's not, that was from Shark Tank, but guys, come on. There is no special thing you can eat. There's no way out of this besides you got to put in the right amount of work. You got to do respiratory muscle training. If you're inflamed because of bronchitis, then you need to take the right medication that gets the medication deep enough for that to be alleviated. Once you go into pulmonary rehab, people usually have like eight, 10 medications they take for their respiratory complications in their heart. Okay, and the, at the end of our program, they usually wind up with one or two of those out of 10. Okay, some of them don't use, need the medication anymore. That's what rehab's supposed to be doing for you, not keeping you the same. We don't structure our stuff to keep anybody the same. We don't ever do that. We strive on, on transformation, not keeping anybody the same in, in HRN. HRN is a very well it's a very well known, okay, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like global, but even though we advertise globally, but HRN is the home rehab network. You rehab yourself from your own home, okay? I am currently working to get into your program. My doctor did the referral, got a call from HRN the other day, just waiting on insurance. Oh, no problem, Sandra, no problem. But guys, there is, but everybody, there is no special medication. There is no special anything. It's just therapy. You can give as much food and stuff to somebody they want, but if they're not moving, they're always going to be winded because they're out of shape because they haven't moved for a very long time. You have somebody who has all these diseases and they have these complications. Well, we stretch out the lungs to make the symptoms a lot less where it's not very noticeable anymore. You do another pulmonary function test, you increase your lung functions by our program. That's, that's been what, what has been happening, okay? Um, yeah, uh, things, there is no, nothing special you can eat. That, I have to say, is completely inaccurate. And if, it, if you felt it was accurate, then I would like to see the FDA IRB. That's a peer review. That means other clinicians, other scientists, other doctors, are looked and see if that is fact based off of a hundred plus people. So even though I, I'm like, oh, here's a special medication that can fix everybody. I can't state that, hey, that's correct. Just because I have, I got lucky with one person or myself. I have to base it off of hundreds of people, not one person, hundreds of people. And then I will take that data, give it to another person, clinician that is that does investigative review boards give it to another one and that person will see if that's the same results that i got then that'll be sent to another one so it goes through review process it's called peer review to determine if this is a fact or not looking at contraindications looking at hazards looking at affordability looking at every single thing for whatever that medication was to this date there is nothing like that okay you can talk that, oh, I ate grass, or, you know, there was another person using Windex. I mean, lit like, they say, oh, no, I use Windex. And I said, what? well, it's great for glass. What do, you, what do you mean you use Windex? They breathe it in. I was like, what are you doing? You don't do that. That's an alcohol base. What are you thinking about? 
I said, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing, you know? He said, well, I've used it for years. I said, then why are you seeing somebody like me? I, what do you mean? I said, well, if the Windex worked, why are you coming to me with all these complications? So whatever you're using is obviously not working, right? I mean, it's not rocket science, right? Okay, so bronchitis. There's acute and chronic bronchitis. Now, uh, we were talking about filters earlier. Uh, filters, you want to make sure you, you, know, you change filters accordingly to the manu according to the manufacturer's instructions. Usually, the instructions are found on the outside perimeter of the, the border of the filter. It'll just say 30 days, uh, you know, 60 days, 90 days. Just double check those and make sure that your, your filter is not clogged up. Okay, because if you find that you are going back and forth to the hospital, then we, find, we found that 60% of the patients have that problem. 60% of our patients, there were, there was their home that was causing them the biggest problem was a heightening of current symptoms. You know, it felt like an exacerbation. In fact, it probably resulted in exacerbations. Does anybody know what an exacerbation is? Uh, by the way, if you have questions, please write in the comments section. I'll be happy to... Uh, go over those questions. All right. So uh, for allergy seasons, uh, to lessen the symptoms, you can drink things like green tea. You can eat things like chicken soup. Um, there are things with mustard in it, uh, Dijon mustard. Um, uh, we found that uh, out of peer review, we found that spicy food, like not necessarily spicy, but like mustard. Things have mustard, like sandwiches, you know, maybe some, you know, whatever, some vegetables you would mix in with mustard maybe. But we found any meals with mustard alleviate a lot of symptoms, okay, as far as, uh, you know, inflammation goes. It won't alleviate it 100%. It will reduce it by maybe 12, 30% maybe. It won't be a complete reduction, but you'll find that if you eat um, citrus fruits, uh, foods that have mustard in it, okay, and uh, drink green teas, you'll find that allergy symptoms won't be as, as severe as it was before. But remember, it's not a cure, okay? I can go over the curing process of allergies, but uh, it's a long process and uh, <laughs> it's, it's very technical. But, um, but anyways, I'm... Uh, does anybody have, have any questions on here? Yes, I would love to. Let's see this, these emailed questions here. So one question is, how do I clear mucus that is almost constant off my trachea, vocal cords, and lungs? I just can't get it clear anymore. I feel like I'm drowning. Um, if you're on a trachea, if you're on a trach, this is a trach trach dummy right here okay if you're on a trachea let me show you so the manibrium is that bone right here um, just below just just uh, posterior of that not anterior not in front of it behind the manibrium bone right here okay behind that is your carina your carina is where, so let's say this is my airway, these are my lungs bifurcating, that right here is called a carina, that right here. So the trachea is about two, three centimeters where the tube is put into the airway just like on that mannequin dummy right there. Okay, so if you're having a lot of congestion and it says, how do I clear mucus that is almost constant off my trachea, vocal cords and lungs. So let's go over that really quick, okay? I'll, be, I'll try to be really quick with this one because I know we're coming into, running into time here, but um, since this is a, since that's what, what, what we specialize in, um, obviously I don't mind coming, going over this. All right, so let's bring up a trachea, trach dummy here. Okay. All right, can we get a close up of that? All right. A 
OK. So let's put a trach in there, tie this over here. OK. All right. OK. Now, there's something really wrong with this. OK. Uh, don't, I'm not expecting anybody to know these answers, by the way. First off, if you're producing a lot of congestion, trach has to be completely straight out. If it's moved over this side or moved over this side a little bit, the trachea itself, let me show you. So let's say this is your airway. If the trachea touches your airway at all, okay, by tilting on one side, on this side, it will cause irritation and cause a lot of congestion. That's one, okay? Now, also on the trachea, it should be cleaned. There should be a DME company or a respiratory therapist, a doctor, or a nurse coming out to clean your trach. When you clean a trach, usually you always clean the inside, but you also want to make sure you clean the outside. So taking, uh, you would need some bacitracin, okay, vitamin A and E, bacitracin, you know, just... Um, first, you would take some bacitracin, put it to the side, so, uh, warm soapy water, okay? <coughs> you take a Q-tip and go underneath the flange. This is called a flange, that plastic piece where it's held by the, this uh, Velcro. So you clean underneath the flange, clean on top, underneath, all the way around. Try not to pull this out ever, okay? This should stay nice and flush against, against the skin. Now, but the only thing is, underneath should be a gauze, a 4x4 four four gauze, to separate the barrier from plastic to skin. And between that should be a gauze that separates that barrier. So we would put a gauze underneath there, but on cleaning, I would remove the gauze first, clean it, clean the inside of the trach, okay? Clean the inside of the trach, and this is a reusable trach. Uh, Shiley has one that you can actually take it off and just dispose it. There are some uh, that are non shilies it's a name brand, um, that are reusable. These are reusable, you don't throw these away. So you would just take a uh, pipe cleaner that comes in a trach care kit and you would clean it out. If there is a lot of junk around, it will cause irritation around, and you, you can really tell it's red around here, you know, but um, if there's a lot of irritation, it will cause a lot of congestion. So that's first. You want to double check to make sure that the trach is completely looking out straight. It's not turned at all, you know, twisted at all, at, you know, at any time. Okay. So you would clean the trach, and then after you clean it with warm, warm soapy water with a, uh, with a Q-tip, okay, then you would put the gauze back on, but before you put the gauze back on, the 4x4, four four, it's just a square gauze. Uh, it just has a hole in there with a slit in it just to go around the trach. Put some bacitracin, uh, the ointment that I told you, and just put it on the gauze. That's going to be on the skin. Okay, so I, I, on my 4x4 four four, uh, gauze, I would put a bacitracin, just put some dabble in there, rub it in and put it underneath where the vast tracing is now touching the skin and the gauze, right? Okay, not facing the other, other way. That will help alleviate a lot of problems, okay? But taking care of your trach is very important, of course. If you're finding that uh, congestion is too thick, um, then you might want to look at your humidity. So when we breathe in, we usually breathe in about 47 millimeters of mercury of, of humidity, usually, okay? That's coming in for your nasal pharynx and down to your oral pharynx, okay? So if I breathe in through my nose, the air moisturizes by breathing in through my, uh, my it's very vascular inside your nose. So it, it naturally humidifies the air. Because there's a trach, you compromise that because now it's bypassing the nasal and oral pharynx to produce humidity. So anybody on a trach should always have humidity attached to their trach, okay, at all times. It could be a humidifier bottle, something like that, but uh, anyways, um, trach, okay? So a trach patient, if there's a lot of thick congestion, having a hard time bringing it out, you wanna cup your hands 
and while the person has the trach, remember, you're not ever pulling the trach out. Clinicians do that. Okay, you cup your hands. Okay, cup them. You're not slapping. You're not slapping. You're cupping, causing resonant sound. Your cup vibrate on each side. Now, of course, the person is laying down. All the person has to, the patient has to do is just breathe. They just have to breathe nice and deep while you're doing this. You'll do it for about 10 minutes and have the person cough about three times very aggressively. They can splint, meaning they can do something where they take their fist, but if, they are, if their cough is not strong enough, you might want to splint them, meaning you assist their cough. So person's having a hard time coughing, I would take my fist, okay, or my hand, and I'll push into the diaphragm as they're coughing, producing more pressure to get that junk out from them. If that's not the case, I would go invasive, meaning I would take a 12 to 14 French catheter, insert it into there, and shove the catheter, catheter all the way down until I hit, you know, until I start feeling some, some junk in there. So I would apply the suctioning to the catheter with, a va with this vacuum. It's not a regular vacuum. You would vacuum the floor. It's, it's a trach vacuum, basically. So it would pull out and suck out the congestion. And then if it's really thick, I might lavage it, meaning I'll put in some, uh, some fluids like saline or maybe just distilled water would be best because saline can, you know, you're using hypertonic and uh, uh, hypotonic solutions. Uh, it might cause irritation. So just simple distilled water will work just fine. Okay, so I'll put some in there while I'm suctioning because if I mix in like fluid, like water, distilled water, and mix it with something that's like thick congestion, it'll loosen it up. So I put in some fluid in there as I'm suctioning, and that will help alleviate that congestion problem. But if the cough is really not, if it's strong, then you don't need a suction. Okay, a person should be able to cough on their own. If they can't produce a good cough because they're trachea, okay, then you can do just chest physiotherapy vibrations. Okay, chest physiotherapy, it's called chest, chest PT. And you can do that to help alleviate those. And like I said, every 10 minutes, have the person cough three times. Um, if they can't pull out anything, okay, and let's say all that really came out was like a teaspoon of stuff, that might not be, in, uh, that might not be uh, congestion related. That might be inflammation. So tissues, remember I, was, I drew up the, the alveoli and the loose tissues? Those loose tissues feel like congestion. You know, that's, that's my feeling. So it means like if I'm coughing <clears throat> and I feel like something is about to come up, but nothing's really coming out besides maybe a teaspoon of something, then that is more inflammation. Your tissues in your lungs are just very loose. feels just like congestion, but it's not. That's treated with medication. Okay, that's treated with medication. Okay. I just wanted to say that, uh, say my name is Michelle Jones. I am in HRN. and ended up in the hospital January 8th to the 10th, and the 8th was the last day. I smoked a cigarette, and I can't tell you how much better I feel since quitting. I just wanted to say thank you to your team and Millie for reaching out to me while I was in the hospital. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, uh, there's another one. Uh, exacerbation is the is a worsening of your COPD symptoms and usually needs an antibiotic to help you get back feeling better. Yes, usually we would go with an antibiotic if it's if it's warranted. Um, but an exacerbation, you're 100 percent right. Uh, right, it's a, it's a heightening of current symptoms. So if you have chronic bronchitis, it's production of a lot more of that. If you have chronic bronchitis. It's wheezing uncontrollably, it feels like. Okay, so anytime you're having an exacerbation, you wanna call that doctor as soon as it happens. Write down as much pertinent information as you can. So if you go to the hospital, they'll see a journal of what you've been feeling, what you've been eating, what has been going on for the past maybe a week. You know, it's always a good idea to write down in a journal when you wake up, you know, just to kind of, hey, Something happened, maybe you left the window open, maybe uh, your home was causing the problem and you noticed that on your filter, write it down. Write it down and give that to your doctor. Don't make it a book, okay, but just, you know, keep
keep it nice and brief, give it to your doctor or to the emergency room attendant, and then that person will make sure it goes to the doctor that's on your, on your case. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, we have another one from our email. Please. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, is it possible to improve breathing and oxygen saturation in my opinion rejection after 10 years since single lung transplant? Currently on nine liters at rest plus nine more upon exertion. I have two concentrators, one with canola, with canola one with signed up with hospice because the transplant team doesn't seem to be able to do anything for me. I am willing to do anything to try it to improve. Okay, so uh, was there a name on this person? No, they didn't leave a name. They didn't leave a name? Okay, so if you're, and your question is, can my lungs improve, basically is, is the question. Uh, can it improve my oxygen saturations? Can I improve? Yes, that that's of course what we do here. Of course it can improve, but you have to go into a therapy program that specializes in weaning people off and increasing lung functions. We specialize in that. We specialize specifically in that. That's why we talk about all the time on these, um, on these, um, on this streaming like uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and things like that on here is because that's, that's what we do for a living here. So yes, it does improve, uh, but you gotta get into therapy for it to improve. If you're on nine liters of oxygen, which is a pretty high flow, liter flow, uh, that's very, very high. I would definitely recommend getting in as soon as you can, at least talking to any of our clinicians about that. Because a lot of people come in to this program when they have no other choice. That should never be your first option. We should always be your first option. Not that, oh, uh, I checked this, I did this, I did that. Nothing seems to wor be working. I'm at, I'm at death's gate right now, and now I'm going to seek help. People should be seeking help before they get to that point where everything is at the worst case scenario basis. Now, even if you're at the worst case scenario and you feel like you're knocking on death's door, okay, we can still improve you. I mean, there are, there are reports and, and uh, you know, statistics that just look on the American Lung Association, somebody with end-stage COPD would still benefit from pulmonary rehab, and they're based off of the regular traditional pulmonary rehabs out there. So yeah, with ours, of course, you'll, get, you'll be benefited quite a bit because we're a certified program. So yes, of course. Um, I hope that answers that question. Uh, like yeah, if you're feeling desperate and you're afraid, Give us a call. We can't force you because we're a doctor's office. You know, we're a doctor's office, but we're a clinic. You know, this is a this is the home rehab network. So you have to call us up and make an appointment. It's a very quick turnaround. It's not like you call us up. You have to wait months. It's usually that day that you will get to talk to at least somebody and then um, then talk to a doctor and things like that. So I would recommend trying to call us up. Okay, look us up online, Home Rehab Network. I mean, we, we own the uh, support group on Facebook, the COPD sub, uh, support group. Okay, so we, that's ours. So just look on there, and it has the numbers on the banner. Just type in Home Rehab Network on a Google search. We show up everywhere. Okay, we're rated five stars on everything. Our patient satisfactories are above 98%. I mean, there's no, there should be no excuse not to do this, okay? And it's covered under insurance. I mean, but you got to help me help you. So I, I got to know what your name is. I got to know how to contact you, things like that, to talk to you. But I would recommend calling us, okay? Uh, any other questions? Uh, just some from, uh, from the email if you want to answer them. Um, sure. So Delta V, that's the, um, this will be the last question I'll bring over, uh, bring up because it's already over time. So a Delta V, if you have a Delta V, um, you could ask your assigned clinician how to use it, but um, just for argument's sake, so this is a Delta V. A Delta V 
easily attaches to an incentive spirometer. So here's an incentive spirometer. Okay. So I take the mouthpiece off the original mouth, the mouthpiece that was on the that came with the incentive spirometer, take it out, and replace it with the delta V. It fits just like so. It even fits into here with ease. Okay. All right. So on a delta V, this is a respiratory muscle trainer. This by itself is not a respiratory muscle trainer. This is. Okay, but how fast you breathe in is what makes the weight. So if you, on a delta V, you have an arrow. The arrow, you can see, kind of see that arrow. The arrow points at the number. So let's say you set it to a six. Okay, you want to see if a six is, is the right setting for you. Let's say you don't know. So the rule of thumb is, if I set this to a six or whatever number I want, uh, it's from zero to six, uh, zero to seven. Uh, zero is always used for measuring, without using any respiratory resistance. Okay, so I have this right now at a six, and I want to see if this is a if this is the right setting. So if I can keep the flow meter ball with between the arrows on this, but from midway, the halfway mark or above, that's where I want to be at. That's the correct setting. If it, this flow meter ball can't go up very high, doesn't even make it halfway up, then the resistance is too heavy. Okay, so, because remember, how fast you breathe in is what makes the weight. If I have this at a six or a seven, I breathe in super slow, the weight might be only two pounds when you need 24 pounds. Okay, so I breathe in. I have this at a, a six. I don't know if this is the right setting for me, so I'm going to check. Remember, I'm not using the piston chamber anymore. I'm using the flow meter side. Okay, this flow meter right here. I'm using this. So I breathe in, trying to bring up the flow meter ball to halfway or higher. So I breathe in through a six. I, can't make, I can make it somewhat halfway, but I can't bring it up higher than that. That means the resistance is too heavy. Okay, so now I know I'm not going to use that weight. So I, let's say I didn't know. I brought it up to a 7. I can only bring the flow meter ball a quarter of the way up, not halfway or above. So 7 is obviously too heavy. If I go into a gym, I don't pick up the heaviest weight there is because I, not, I might not be able to lift it and to complete a full rep, repetition. So obviously this works the same way. So I bring it down, let's say I use a three. I breathe in. I can easily bring the flow meter ball all the way to the top. That means the weight resistance of a three is too light for me. So I bring it up to a four, do the same thing. It's a little tight, but it's not too bad, but I can still bring the flow meter ball all the way to the top. So I move it to a five. So five looks like it's the best setting for me. Now that I know my setting, I don't have to use it with the incentive spirometer. I use the, if, I use the delta V with the incentive spirometer if I want to know what setting to be at. Okay. Once I have my proper setting, where it's not too heavy and it's not too light, I start my respiratory muscle training. I place this on my mouth, pass my teeth, feel it with my lips. I breathe in. You're going to fill up your lungs 100%. And then you want to try adding more air into those lungs. Even though it feels like nothing else is coming in, you still want to try to encourage yourself to keep breathing in. Like even though nothing else is coming in, it is just these very small, unnoticeable volumes, these little micro improvements. And after a while, they perpetuate and increase and increase. Your lungs are actually getting larger where more air can come in. Okay? So you breathe in. You have six seconds to inhale. You have, you have four seconds to inhale as deep as you can. You have another two seconds to keep bringing air in. So... Once I hit four seconds, okay, I should have filled up my lungs 100%. Then for an additional two seconds, okay. 
and get an additional two seconds, I try to bring in more even though it feels like nothing else is coming in. After I get to that point, I exhale. And deplete all the air from out from my lungs, that were, that was, the air that was filled in my lungs, get it all out. Okay, you have four seconds to get rid of it all. Then you have four seconds to fill it back up with an additional two seconds, which is a total of six seconds, to keep bringing more air in. In a way of saying, you have six seconds of inhale time, you have four seconds of exhale time. You do that around six times a day, 10 minutes each. Now, all the other variations of exercise, I can't go over unless you're in this program and I'm seeing you in front of me, okay? Meaning, I'm seeing you through, uh, through your camera and I can see you sitting, doing respiratory, I, that's where I need to see you at. Then I can go over other respiratory muscle trainings, but I can't go over them all overall because like some people have one lung, some people have all their lungs while they have a lot of disease. Everyone's different. So it's based off of the person. Okay. Respiratory muscle training is always done six times a day, 10 minutes each. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you for joining us. I will see you next time on Thursday. See ya. Bye-bye.